Okay. Well, um, I'd say good morning, but I don't know what time it is that you're watching this. So uh, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. It's the Young Readers Edition, and it is by Jean Theo Harris. And we are doing a first chapter. So um, uh, you have a worksheet to do. You can get it in class or you can do the digital one online. Maybe open it up in Notability to fill it out. Um, or in maybe a Google Doc and you can fill it out. Uh, so here we go. Chapter one, a shy rebel is born. Sorry, I, I'm hoping captions work, but they may not. And I can't show this at the same time because I don't have a doc cam at home anymore. Here we go. Rosa Parks' spirit of resistance began early and it began at home. In fact, she credited her mother and grandfather for her spirit of freedom as they made clear that she should not feel because of my race or color inferior to any person. Rosa Louise McCauley was born on February 4th, 1913 in Tuskegee, Alabama. She was named for her grandmothers on both sides, Rose and Louisa. Rosa's parents had been had both been raised in Alabama. Her mother, Leona Edwards, was from a small town called Pine Level, and her father, James McCauley, grew up a little over an hour south of there in Ab Abbeville, Abbeville. Leona was a school teacher, but she stopped teaching when she became pregnant with Rosa. She didn't do much to hide how isolated and lonely she felt as a new mother. Rosa remembered that she always talked about how unhappy she was. James continued working as a skilled carpenter and stonemason, which required him to leave home for long stretches of time. Leona wasn't happy about this and urged him to find work at Tuskegee Institute, a historically black college and university nearby. James wasn't interested, though, and continued to spend most of his time on the road. When Rosa was two years old, her little brother Sylvester, named for their maternal grandfather, was born. Shortly after, James left the family for good. Leona was tired of raising her children alone, so she packed up their belongings and moved them to live with her parents back in Pine Level. So, Rosa grew up without her father, but she was raised in a house full of love, surrounded by three generations, her mother, grandparents, and great-grandfather. Both Rosa's grandparents had been enslaved. Her grandfather was born to a mother who'd been impregnated by the slave owner's son and had endured a traumatic childhood. Brought up battling violence and near starvation, he had, Rosa said, a somewhat belligerent attitude toward white people. And because he looked white, he used this privilege to say and do things that would embarrass and agitate white people. Leona returned to teaching after James left the family. Schools in Alabama were segregated, as they were across the country. But instead of employing almost all white teachers, black schools in Alabama frequently hired black educators. They often weren't treated well, though, and it wasn't easy to get a job as a black teacher. So for years, Rose's mother had to work at a school in a town called Spring Hill, two hours away from their home in Pine Level. Leona stayed in Spring Hill during the week, only coming home on weekends. Despite her grandparents' love and care, Rosa had a difficult time with her mother being away so long, one time saying that she and Sylvester didn't have a mama or no papa either. The Macaulay Edwards family had high expectations in their household. Rosa learned the importance of self-respect, which in her home meant acting respectable and demanding the same respect from others. Rosa's grandfather, Sylvester Edwards, was proud and politically aware. He supported the Black Nationalist leader, Marcus Garvey, born and raised in Jamaica. Garvey founded the Universe Universal Negro Improvement Association before he immigrated to the United States in 1916. Garvey and the organization were focused on Black pride and self-sufficiency, the founding of independent Black businesses, and the idea that Black Americans should return to Africa. Rose's grandfather admired Garvey's strong message of Black pride and independence. There was an increase of white violence against Black people after World War I. Although Black soldiers had endangered their lives fighting for their country, many white people believed they needed to be put back in their place when they returned home from the war. That summer after the war ended became known as Red Summer. Many white people didn't want black Americans to get ideas about freedom and equality, even though the United States was their home too, and they'd risk their lives fighting for it. Violence from the terrorist group, the Ku Klux Klan, worsened in Pine Level during this time. Rose's grandfather, who had known the horrors of white violence since his days as an enslaved child, refused to be intimidated. Instead of hiding from fear after nightfall, he set up shop on the front porch with a shotgun. The family slept in their clothes so they could be ready to run in case of attack. Sometimes six-year-old Rosa would sit vigil with him on the porch. I wanted to see him kill a Ku Kluxer, she said. Her fierce determination started early and at home. Rosa was a lifelong reader in part because her mother taught her how to read, along with how to do math. 
before she was even old enough to attend school. I don't even remember when I didn't a time when I didn't read, she said. The school for black children in Pine Level was bare bones, consisting of a meager one room, unpainted shack with wooden shutters and no windows. Black children in the South attended school for only six months out of the year since so many worked on farms and in the fields to help provide for their families. White students, however, attended classes for nine months, most unencumbered by the extra workload their black peers took on. White children in general were offered a better education and more convenient circumstances. They had the luxury of a school bus while Rosa and her friends had to walk to school. When Rosa was very young, the town used money from everyone's taxes to build a nice new school for white children. Black people, however, were on their own. They had to build and heat their own schools without the help of the town or county or state. Meanwhile, Rosa's mother was still teaching in Spring Hill and other black church schools around the state, which often took her away from the family during the week. Teaching could be dangerous work for black people. The Ku Klux Klan would sometimes travel around the county attacking and burning down black schools. When a job at Rosa's school in Pine Level opened up, her mother took the job, finally able to be close to her family Monday through Friday. As a kid, Rosa was often sick. Medical care was costly, and it took years for her family to save enough money to have her tonsils removed. Since she was home sick a lot, she read a lot. One of the books she read, likely without her family knowing, was called Is the Negro a Beast? by William Gallo Shell. In the book, Shell argued against the popular theory that Black people were beasts and therefore fit for slavery, but he still believed Black people were inferior to white people. Rosa was devastated after reading the book, realizing that much of America did not consider Black people to be complete human beings. She wanted to prove that Black inferiority was a myth, that Black people were not unintelligent until proven otherwise, but she felt overwhelmed. How would she do this? Discovering Black history in school provided the answer. Rosa said, I read everything I could, first in school and then later in magazines. She educated herself on the long history of Black intelligence and innovation, which clearly proved Shell wrong. But Rosa was bothered by how this history was buried. The achievements of Black Americans were not celebrated or even noted in the same way as they were those of white Americans. She fought the rest of her life to change this. Rosa found solace in church as a child. Attending services was one of the events I could look forward to. The Christian faith was proof to Rosa that God supported freedom for all people, and if God believed in equality, shouldn't all of his believers do the same? Being Black in Alabama in the 1920s meant trying to live a normal life while also knowing danger could be lurking around every corner. It was normal to not only fear, but also to expect violence from white people on a daily basis. Figuring out how to negotiate this was a constant struggle. Rosa may have been shy, but at key moments, she wasn't afraid to stand up for herself. Maybe the habit of protecting my little brother helped me learn to protect myself. One of her childhood friends pointed out that nobody ever bossed Rosa around and got away with it. Once a young white kid named Franklin was taunting her and bothering Rosa and Sylvester. Tired of his bullying, Rosa grabbed a loose brick and dared him to hit her. Dared him to hit me. Franklin thought better of the idea and went away. Rosa later recounted the incident to her grandmother. To her surprise, her grandmother got angry at her for being so bold. Scared for her safety, she scolded Rosa, saying she was too high strung and that she shouldn't be too talking she shouldn't be talking biggity to white folks. Lynching was a serious threat to black people, and her grandmother warned Rosa that if she can't continue to stand up for herself, she'd become one of its victims before she was grown. Rosa felt betrayed by her grandmother and furious, she argued back. I would rather I would be lynched rather than live to be mistreated and not be allowed to say I don't like it. Her grandmother was only trying to protect Rosa to keep her from being targeted and attacked or even killed. But Rosa didn't like that. She was being told to keep quiet and put up with unfair treatment, especially not by someone who understood how dehumanizing it was to be threatened and not defend herself. She would struggle with this balance for the rest of her life. Whites would accuse you of causing trouble when all you were doing was acting like a normal human being instead of cringing. Bold action was a way to get people's attention, and this could lead to change, but it was dangerous, and it could also lead to violence or death. Still, resistance was a way to fight oppression and assert her self-worth. Rose's resistance was just getting started. And it's got little captioned pages um, of her actual diaries. And this one says, I would rather be lynched than live to be mistreated and can't and can't say I don't like it. When I was very little girl, not more than 10 years old, I angrily cried these words to my grandmother in answer to a severe scolding she gave me. 
I happened to quite casually mention that a white boy had met, met me in the road some days before and had said he would hit me. He made a threatening gesture with his fist at the same time he spoke. I picked up a small piece of brick and drew back to strike him if he should hit me. I was angry though he seemed to, and that was, that's all you could read. And we just covered the story. Uh, there was another um, piece from a diary of hers, early childhood incident and experience. Deserted by my father at two and a half years, shortly before brother brother's birth. Uh, mother was with her semi-invalid parents, great, great grandfathers playing with my brother and me. He was on, you know what? I cannot read her writing, but um, it has a picture of her mother, Leona Macaulay. Uh, that was her married name. And there's nothing else there. So hopefully you you looked at the worksheet before you listened to this so you could fill it out and draw and rate the first chapter. And I will see you in class.